Okay, I think, um, I think we have a critical mass, so I think we should get started. I want to welcome everybody. My name is Chet Kerr. I'm on the board of the Irvington Astoral Society. And today we're doing a presentation by uh, Joe Lombardi uh, and Mike Lombardi and Jess, Lombard Jess Hale about the Octagon House here in Irvington. So a couple of quick announcements. Uh, this is all being recorded and we will post a recording of this up on our website after the, today's presentation. There also is gonna be a question and answer session at the end. And if, if you have questions during the course of the presentation or at the end, you can put them in the chat. And at the end, at the finish of Joe's presentation, we'll go through those questions, see if we can, and Joe and Mike and Jess can answer them for everybody. So with that, I'd like to, uh, introduce Scott Mosenthal, who is on the board of the Urban Historical Society, and Scott is going to introduce Joe. So, Scott, let me turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you, Chet. My name is Scott Mosenthal, and I am a member of the Irving Historical Society. I'm privileged to introduce Joseph Lombardi, who today will talk about his remarkable work with the Octagon House. I came to know Joe through the Irvington Historical Society's Legacy Project, which honors a small number of senior Irvington residents each year who have had a significant impact upon the village. Joe, an internationally renowned restoration architect and preservationist who has owned the Octagon House since 1978 was an obvious choice. Joe came to Irvington in 1953 from a New York City neighborhood. As he mentioned in his Legacy interview, as a youngster, he had a newspaper route on West Clinton Avenue and was very much aware of the Octagon House. This uniquely fabulous structure influenced him because it showed him how extraordinarily strange, fascinating, and even haunting an older house could be. When Joe was 38 and practicing restoration architecture in New York City, the Octagon's then owner, Carl Carmer, gave an interview to the New York Times and said that he was interested in doing something with the house. He was ready to let go of it. At the moment, there was a developer who had the bright idea to tear down the Octagon House, get a variance to create eight houses on the land and call it Octagon Park. Joe met with Carl and said, quote, I am going to be the one that's restoring this house come hell or high water. The rest of course is history. He has been restoring the home and the various other buildings on the grounds for the past 44 years. The Octagon House, also known as the Armour Steiner House, is one of the most visually unique homes in the world. It is the only fully domed octagonal residence and is the only known residence in the world built in the domed colonnaded shape of a Roman temple. The interior of the house, its decoration and its 1870s furnishings are the best display in the country of the American Neo-Roman style, which was popular in the late 19th century. The house is an Irvington treasure, as is its owner. I am honored to present Joe Lombardi to you for today's talk. Thank you kindly, Scott. That was very kind of you, and your, your words are like magic, beautiful. So I'll, I'm gonna begin by sharing my screen. <clears throat> and uh, first of all, let me say that I'm uh, honored to be doing this presentation, and I'm also honored to have um, restored the Octagon House. <clears throat> this motto, which is up on the screen, um, has really been very much the motto of our family's life in the uh, field of restoration, um, that, that in fact, conservation and restoration of our built environment is really the one firm foothold. And so often I've, I've thought of this uh, wonderful saying. The Armistein of Octagon House um, is of special significance to our family. Um, and we, as Scott so kindly mentioned, we've been at it for 44 years and it'll continue on in the family um, doing the very same thing that 
that's been occurring so far. This is a, a video clip, approximately four minutes. That will eventually be a, a one hour video clip that's going to be available. Armour Steiner Octagon House is one of the most visually unique homes in the world. By the 1970s, although still remarkably intact, the house was in extreme disrepair. The entire structure was on the verge of imploding, with the spectacular dome so separated at the seams that birds could enter through the gaps. The house was on the brink of becoming only a photographic memory. In 1976, the National Trust for Historic Preservation acquired the house in order to save it for future generations. In need of stabilization and conservation, it was the first house to be acquired by the National Trust and resold to a private citizen. Joseph Pell Lombardi, a preservation architect specializing in conservation, restoration, and historic preservation throughout the world. I was in architectural school in the 1960s, and in the 1960s, architectural schools were the forefront and the heyday of modernism. And the idea that somebody would go through architectural school with the intent of doing conservation and restoration of historic structures was not accepted at all. None of my fellow students thought that way. Lombardi began a 40-year conservation effort of the house and grounds, correcting the home's extensive structural problems, including all surfaces, decoration, utility systems, missing pieces, and the landscape. Lombardi described the work as finding the missing pieces of a 500,000-piece jigsaw puzzle. There was a fair amount to lose, not only the loss of the architectural fabric, but reputationally or personally, or just the emotional investment that he had in the property. Certainly there was a lot on the table. What Joe Lombardi organized as an intervention was really speculative for one thing. <laughs> he was also taking a big financial risk and not knowing what the outcome would be. There must have been some dark moments when he wondered whether it was really all gonna come together or not. He had the interest, the passion, the capacity, but Joe could see it was still certainly a major challenge. You can get your heart broken by a place if it's lost. One of the things about the restoration of this house that is so special is the adherence to all the details as they were found. That's really the essence of the practice of historic preservation. Joe was absolutely insistent. Nothing was gonna be changed if it could be preserved. His goal was not to remove all traces of age, but to hold together this fragile, exotic beauty of a lyrical home. What was at stake for me was everything, really. Here I was, a, a young preservationist, starting out with something that could become a failure. And if it became a failure, I wasn't going to be known for the person who saved the Octagon House. I was going to be known for the person who lost the Octagon House. 
there was no retreat. I was too committed. So taking on the Octagon House really meant that my whole career was at stake. So backstepping and backtracking for a moment, I uh, grew up on the Upper West Side of Manhattan where my, I spent my first 13 years. But it was a very formative uh, period for me architecturally, interesting enough. Even as a very young man, I appreciated the uh, magnificent um, movie theaters on Broadway and the uh, idiosyncratic uh, townhouses of Hamilton Terrace. I would uh, go around uh, on the Upper East Side with uh, an old architectural history book my dad had given me and try to identify these uh, uh, architectural marvels, uh, including uh, uh, the church and wonderful uh, uh, city college with its collegiate Gothic uh, architecture. And very importantly for me, uh, even at the age of six, if you had asked me, what did I wanna do? It was to be a restoration architect. And I know that sounds quite amazing. Uh, why wasn't I going to be a fireman or a policeman or whatever else six-year-olds like to do? And it all came about because there was a, a small lodge that my family had that we would retreat to in the 1940s out of the city. And for me, this was a paradise. And this paradise lodge became uh, the focus of my attention. And uh, I wanted to conserve it and restore it. and that became uh, the forefront of my, foreshadowed the rest of my life, certain. And when I was 13, uh, my family moved to Irvington and I went to uh, Irvington High School. And after Irvington High School, on to Carnegie Mellon University, and then to Columbia University, where I studied uh, historic preservation. And as Scott mentioned, uh, all of architectural school and all of Columbia University most certainly I was uh, considered a really a heretic because my interest was only going to be to work on the built environment, to do restoration, conservation. And that really wasn't even a discipline in the architectural schools of the 1960s. My thesis at Columbia University was to convert the Chrysler building to a residential building. And remarkably enough, uh, uh, within 10 years of graduating from Columbia, I was sitting in the offices of the owners of the Chrysler building trying to buy it to just do that. That didn't come about, but lots of other different things did come about. One of the first somewhat interesting projects was a instant rehab, a 48 hour rehabilitation of a tenement uh, using prefabricated uh, housing components. But the real work was the conservation restoration work. And it really was a question of my being in my lifetime, I think, in the right place at the right time for a conservation architect. Because in the 1960s, Manhattan was filled with these wonderful townhouses that originally had been elegant one family houses, but had been converted during the depression and the second world war into rooming houses. They were quite inexpensive, but they were remarkably intact because the conversion hadn't been a heavy duty work. People had just essentially moved into the original houses as, as multiple houses. And it was the right time because on the west side, we had Lincoln Center coming about in 1964. West Side Story brought attention to the west side. The jazz of the west side was an important role. And these townhouses, I was able to acquire and restore and to advocate them to my clients. And it, it became a, a, a very solid, steady type of business. And likewise, in the Murray Hill Kipps Bay area, we had the Kipps Bay Plaza. Chris Lombardi. And which also brought attention to that um, area and made the rooming houses of the 30s, uh, of the 30s of Manhattan. Um, a great opportunity for their restoration as townhouses. 
And these townhouses just kept on going and going. And before long, I had converted so something like 150 of them and still do an occasional townhouse. The practice uh, continued on with uh, houses in Westchester and historic lobbies, always historic buildings, including uh, some buildings in Venice, Italy, um, in Nantucket, uh, the Cartier building, and um, the seaport in uh, lower Manhattan. About this time, my two sons were starting to get to the age where we needed a place to uh, retreat from the city. And we took on the, uh, the wonderful Haldane House in Cold Spring, New York, uh, which was a pure restoration conservation work and really my first house that I did like that. And then with the uh, family getting a bit older, we took on a, uh, a wonderful parsonage in Peru, Vermont, uh, which was a totally intact 1850s a house that just had not been touched. It was a preservationist dream. So for me, it was the conservation of that house. Well, for the kids, it was the skiing at Bromley and Stratton. And then in the early 1970s, uh, the loft concept came about, or I should say, identification of Lower Manhattan's um, commercial buildings. And I, I had put this quote up because I often thought about it at the time. I'm like a one-eyed cat peeping in a seafood store. That's what it was like discovering these uh, commercial buildings. And I wanna be clear, these weren't warehouse buildings. These were magnificent bank buildings and uh, store buildings that had been passed over by time as Manhattan had moved north. And here they were intact in foreclosure and available very inexpensively and this was before even the idea of a loft existed. Uh, the word loft was a new word that occurred during this time. And words like Soho and Tribeca that are all household world, words to us today came about during this period. And I just kept on doing this and doing this over and over again. It was an exciting and wonderful time. The buildings were magnificent. It was a period of great discovery, great excitement, and great fun. Uh, there were even infill buildings with different materials like uh, riveted steel and, and glass block and additional wonderful buildings in um, upper portions of Tribeca. It got so popular that almost as a, amusing that people in Brazil, a developer in Brazil asked me to go to Sao Paulo and they didn't have warehouses or elegant old buildings, although actually I did discover some for them, uh, but they wanted to build a new building and call it the, the loft. <laughs> so I, I got involved in that. And then in 1978, I, I, the New York City was on the brink of um, a very, very serious recession. People were saying, which I heard for a number of times in my lifetime, that Manhattan would never come back that Lower Manhattan was finished. And this ma magnificent building, Liberty Tower, was under foreclosure, was um, being offered for sale for $25,000 cash. It sounds like it's an impossible thing, but that's what it was. And so I begged, borrowed, and stole 25,000 and joined it with some other people and acquired it. It was uh, substantially vacant with these wonderful interiors. And again, I, a preservation. Uh, uh, remarkable preservation project. Uh, again, in 2001, I heard again that Lower Manhattan would never come back. That was the view from the 29th floor of Liberty Tower after the, uh, the World Trade Center went down. But now back to Irvington, which is really the main focus of this discussion. Irvington in the 1860s was essentially devoid of, uh, of the forest. It had been deforested by the farmers and was open land with relatively little, uh, uh, very few buildings because they were just simply um, farmhouses. The village of Irvington had started to uh, come about and just uh, south, uh, one mile south of the village of Irvington, let me get my pointer, uh, 
a, an additional town was planned to be on where West Clinton is presently. And it was to be called Abbotsford. So you can imagine that another village was going to occur there. And so one of the first houses that got built was a, an octagonal house, uh, which was the, um, which was a question as to why one would go ahead and use or build an octagonal house. And let me explain that for you. So it was the case that uh, in this period of the 19th century, uh, Orson Squire Fowler wrote a book called The Octagon Mode of Building, which actually became to be an incredibly popular um, book. And it's hard to imagine, but some 3,000 octagonal houses were built based upon this book. Relatively small, like this little house here. And they're scattered throughout the country, um, really kind of obscure. Uh, probably only about 2,000 of them still exist, but they're out there. Only a very, very few of them are of the, the caliber of the Armistein Octagon House, perhaps three of them that are so large and elegant. The rest were an inexpensive way of housing as Orson Fowler saw it. Now, Fowler also had another uh, industry or business, which was that he was a phrenologist, which was the study of the bumps on one's head. He believed that, that people exercise uh, certain particular muscles in their brain, and that would elevate portions of their head. So he would feel your cranium, and for a dollar tell you that the stubborn portion was elevated, that you should be less stubborn, ask you for a dollar, he would then come back and see if you would practice being less stubborn, and therefore that part of your cranium had reduced. Uh, the New York Times said, in fact, there's just one fault with phrenology, and that is that it's not true and not a trace of a ghost of reason for believing it to be true. But nonetheless, uh, Fowler was a very uh, popular uh, person at the time. So enter uh, Joseph Steiner. Now, Steiner was an enormously successful tea merchant. He was the Starbucks of the 19th century. He had 76 tea and coffee shops scattered throughout Manhattan, as well as being a very important importer of teas and coffees. So he bought that two-story house that Armour had built in the 1860s and reconstructed it entirely. So the house very much is the Armour Steiner, the Armour Steiner house is very much the Steiner house that was created by Joseph Steiner in 1872 after he acquired it. Now, what Steiner did is that he added on to Paul Armour's uh, two-story 1860 house and added the dome and completely reconfigured the house. He did it at a time when Neo-Roman or Roman style was extremely popular in the uh, third quarter of the 19th century America. And the house is essentially uh, the creation of a classic, <laughs> excuse me, of a classic building, much like the United States Capitol building, but more important, it's exactly like the Tem Tempetto by Bermonti. And the Tempetto is what influenced uh, Steiner or Steiner's designers in creating the Arma Steiner Octagon House as we know it today. The house had all of the attributes that Fowler felt were important about an octagonal shaped house. Namely, and very importantly, and very true, that you can see into the grounds from eight directions, which is really a, a marvelous part, that rooms open to one another in an adjacent way, that there's a central staircase that uh, provides ventilation out of an observatory on the top. To give proper ventilation from the gas light fixtures. Steiner sold the house shortly after his wife passed away, the feeling being that it was a labor of love of uh, he and his wife. And it went through a succession of several owners, uh, one of the noted being uh, John Cunningham 
of the uh, famed uh, Cunningham and Walsh advertising agency. That photo on the left-hand top is uh, drawn Cunningham's period. And Cunningham rented the Armisteiner Octagon House to Aleko Lilius, who wrote of his adventures with uh, Lai Sam, who was a female Chinese pirate, true story, who had 10,000 buccaneers under her stewardship and uh, plundered ships off the coast of China in the, uh, in the 1920s. The most celebrated uh, owner of the Octagon House was of course Carl Connor, who said that people who choose to live in Octagon houses are mad and therefore unpredictable and therefore sometimes worthy of psychic, psychic research. Karma respected the house greatly. Carl told me in uh, 1976, he said, Joe, if you wind up um, acquiring this house and you're looking for any mis missing piece, pieces, look under the porch. Every time anything fell off the porch, oh, fell off the house, I threw it under the porch so that some future owner could put this house back together again. And that was true. And over and again, underneath that porch, we discovered wonderful things. Uh, Karma enjoyed the house wonderfully and had Victorian style uh, parties. This was a party that was sponsored by uh, Life Magazine. And he occasionally allowed groups to uh, tour the house, but he cherished it and respected it. So in, the, in 1976, as you heard in the introduction, uh, Karma was, um, was ailing and uh, wanted to sell the house and was looking for ways in which it could be uh, conserved. And fortunately enough, it didn't go with the developer who wanted to tear it down, but rather the National Trust stepped forward. I had assured the National Trust that I would be more than willing to uh, step forward and, and to acquire it if I could and to do a complete uh, conservation. Um, effort. This was a gigantic task for me. I was a young restoration architect just starting out in, in my career. And uh, as you saw in the clip, um, the last thing I wanted to have happen was for it to fail. I wanted it to succeed. But I also felt very strongly that it shouldn't be restored, that the house was so perfectly intact albeit in terrible, terrible condition, that it should be conserved in every which way, that all of the hardware should be kept, the bathrooms kept, everything kept exactly like it was, because what was really there was what had been there in 1872 and hadn't been disturbed. It had just deteriorated. The grounds likewise were like that. They were substantially overgrown, Nothing had happened for decades and decades, and the interiors were just in a dreadful condition. But for me, they were in a wonderful condition, meaning that they were all intact. Nobody had come in and replasted them or redid them in a way that was destructive of the original fabric. But there was one extremely serious problem, and that was is that a dome requires a girdle at the base, the circle with the arrow that holds the dome in position, that stops it from exploding outward. It's a very, very critical piece of the construction. But for some odd reason, the dome, when it was added to this house, didn't have that tension ring at the base. It should have, the architectural books at the time spoke of it, but it didn't. <coughs> so the dome had separated so much that birds were able to fly in in the separations and had come apart and split at the seams. So the question was, is how, how to go about it? An engineer associate of mine, Eugene Avalon, had the idea of wrapping it in high tension steel uh, cables with turnbuckles uh, and also having cables going from one corner to another with turnbuckles and to slowly bring it back into uh, position. This was an untried idea um, and certainly gave uh, a great deal of concern. And there were a lot of doubting Thomases who said that the idea simply 
wasn't going to work. But fortunately for all of us, uh, after two years of slowly tightening it, it came back. I had predicted it would not come back into position perfectly, but it did. It actually slid back in the last moment. And so we put a tension ring uh, hidden uh, behind the second floor gutter, which was a, a steel band around the base. And that provided the stability that made the octagon house dome uh, stable for uh, now forever. And so we were able to start in on the interiors. That's uh, son Mike with his little sore, and that's me bent over. I forget exactly what we were doing, but here we were starting in on this monumental uh, task with uh, you know resources that were kind of a catch and catch can, and uh, but committed in one way. We were not going to allow anything new to come in. It had to be exactly what was there originally. If we couldn't find a door hinge that was the original door hinge, well, the door just couldn't get hung until we could find the right hinge. So we, we continued on with the work of the house. Um, we put in new mechanicals, plumbing, heating, electric, but everything 100% concealed and nothing disturbing the uh, interior fabric of the house. Research played a huge part in this. Um, understanding a thing clearly is half the doing is certainly a, a, the right phrase. We had this extraordinarily important 1880s photograph of the first owner after Steiner, which is a George Dibble. And it was a high resolution photograph that was at the uh, New York Historical Society. And based upon blow ups of it, <coughs> we were able to uh, make detailed drawings of exactly what uh, was missing. We could find the location by the impression of it on the house, but for the exact uh, configuration, we looked to the photograph. And likewise, for things like the bases and the uh, sweep of the stair, here was uh, the lamp. On the left side is the 1884 uh, photograph from uh, Dibble's time. And on the right is the restored lamp. And that's the lamp that one of the lamps that uh, Carmer had thrown underneath the porch. And sure enough, I found, or we found, and we restored and conserved, and it's back in location. Throughout the house, uh, we follow the uh, the very important, important theory that a facsimile is always worse than the ruin. So wherever there's original wood, it stays as the original wood. And therefore future generations can check the contour and the shape of it uh, to make sure that we did it exactly the way with as much of the original material as possible. Likewise, the entire interior and the exterior of the house was subjected to a paint analysis. This is an analysis that uh, you take a chip and you look at it microscopically, and you can see the different layers. Um, you go back and you see the first layer, and that determines what the original uh, first color of the house was. And we did this both on the inside of the house and on the uh, outside. The inside remarkably did not have wallpapers. It was all painted. So that meant that we could really and truly make the insides exactly the way they were originally. So the original colors were applied uh, to the exterior uh, based upon paint analysis. The house uh, during um, uh, the 1930s had been primarily painted gray and white, overcoated it, which actually was fine because it protected the paint colors that were underneath it. And so we were able to, um, through paint analysis, repaint everything back to the colors that they were originally. This is uh, Prince, who, who was uh, uh, Steiner's um, show dog. And uh, he memorialized uh, the Octagon House by having, having Prince cast in cast iron on the railing that encircles the, uh, the porch. Um, as in the clip, it, in, indeed, it was like putting back together a 500,000 piece or more jigsaw puzzle because all of these various pieces had to 
um, be carved and created. Fortunately enough, uh, something that's eight-sided, you have a pretty good chance that at least you're going to have one, at least of the original that's in good enough condition. And invariably, we, we had that. Uh, likewise, with the cresting, uh, we had most of the pieces of cresting because it was eight-sided, but there were one or two instances where we had to rely upon the 1884 photograph or blow up of that. The, uh, the slate roof was three colors, um, black and uh, red and gray. And tracing back the original uh, sources in Vermont, we were able to um, have the slate recut again. About 50% of the slate on the house is original and the rest comes from uh, slate companies in Vermont that we believe are the original uh, slate companies. So every piece uh, eventually over the past 44 years has, has come back on the left is the house as it was in uh, 1976 and the right is as it is now. And likewise, there is a before and after on the top and the details of the uh, capitals on the column, which are actually flowers that are uh, local to the, uh, to the gardens. The photograph of the um, urns that sat between the uh, columns was a, was a bit fuzzy. That was as good as it could get, and it just didn't tell us everything. So we went to where the carriage house had originally been, which had burnt down in the 1940s. And we could see the foundation and we did excavation and found the, uh, the chards. And my sons and I uh, pieced together the chards of, the, of the, one of the urns, uh, kept one of the urns as an original and cast the others um, so that we could replace the urn exactly the way it was in 1872. Likewise, the grounds was subjected to a complete uh, plant and root analysis. It is the case that you can uh, dig up a root and uh, determine what the original plant was. So wherever there were depressions or photographs and early photos that showed uh, specimens, we were able to identify what the original plantings were and uh, recreate uh, the original gardens as they were. Uh, based again upon depressions and markings. This is the foxglove garden, which features uh, foxglove as a prominent uh, part of its uh, uh, plantings. And of course, the Octagon House is known for its, its uh, wonderful gardens and uh, they play a very, very important role. The outbuildings uh, were like this, is that as mentioned in 1940, the carriage house had burnt, but there were um, insurance photographs. That left hand upper photograph is an insurance photo. And based upon that, we were able to uh, figure out the height and the dimensions. And, well, we knew the dimensions from the foundation, but um, in the rubble within the foundation, we found pieces of the original carriage house and could determine its original colors and, and detailing. Likewise, the well house. This is a good example of how wonderful it was that that well house had been left intact. And like, you know, you would think uh, that that was like bad news. To me, this was the best news in the world, that nobody had touched that well house, that it had just sat there and deteriorated, agreed. But nobody had torn off the roof or changed any of the elements so that we could study it and analyze it and bring back the well house with its multicolors exactly the way it had been in 1872. And likewise, the interior. Some of the interiors had had wallpapers added, like in the right hand upper corner, but all that had done was protect the painted surfaces that were underneath that through paint analysis and uh, removal of later covers, later coverings, we could determine what the paint uh, configurations were. And underneath those were 
some of these wonderful uh, decorative uh, paint surfaces, stencil surfaces. This is the entryway, which we couldn't imagine that it would have been this. We, we, when we took over the house, it was all painted white. Uh, but the idea that it was going to be a Baroque interior uh, boggled the, ima the imagination. The only reason we can look to for why that might be the case is the great classic uh, Palladian villas have Baroque interiors, and maybe that's what inf influenced Steiner to do a, a Baroque silver, copper, and bronze leaf uh, entryway. So we tackled each of the rooms separately. Uh, the conservatory to the left as you go in the entranceway, the library with its uh, multicolors. There are numerous original uh, light fixtures that are original to the house that are in the octagon house. And over half of the furnishings are original to the octagon house. Now this came about because Cunningham back in the 30s when he owned the house, um, he took the furnishings out that had come with the house and brought them to his house in Riverdale. And so I visited, traced back the owners and visited Cunningham. And when he showed me that the original Octagon House furnishings were there in Riverdale, New York, I said, well, Mr. Cunningham, you must figure out some way that I can acquire this furniture. And he said, Joe, don't worry about this. Let's not worry about this subject. And sure enough, about five years later, I had a letter from his attorney saying that uh, Mr. Cunningham had passed away, but that the furniture had been willed back to the Octagon House in perpetuity on the condition that it stay in the house forever, which was obviously a concept we totally embraced. And so, even though the furnishings were maybe about 30%, they were parts of sets. So we were able to infill sets so that we could create the octagon house as it was uh, furnished uh, in 1872. Some of the furnishings um, are truly extraordinary. A, a Wooten folding desk, a, uh, a complete set of uh, John Jelliffe uh, 12 piece uh, furnishings. Um, the Octagon House never fails to delight. That's kind of a, a saying that we have. In other words, when, when we go about researching and discovering things, it's always the best of the best. It's, it's everything you could ever want in a house or in a furnishings. The um, Eastern Elk is portrayed in a uh, very strong way. The middle photograph on, on the bottom are the um, light fixtures, the sconces in the master bedroom. The uh, shades have a, an image of the Eastern Elk and the sconce itself is an Eastern Elk. It was a revered animal of the 19th century that eventually almost went extinct, uh, but is portrayed uh, throughout the house. Um, the dining room likewise has paintings of uh, the steamships that you would have seen from as low a point um, as the dining room of the Octagon House when you looked out. Today it's uh, grown over, so you don't see anything that's not 19th century, and we have these 19th century paintings. The uh, master bedroom has a wonderful um, 18, late 1850s, perhaps more uh, related to the armor period, set of uh, furnishings with eight sided uh, columns for the bed with painted Hudson River. Uh, scenes. And all of those painted surfaces, again, based upon paint analysis. And so, again, it was just remarkable that a house could go from 1872 to 1976 with its kitchen intact. In other words, nobody had ever modernized the, the kitchen, thank goodness. So the original stove was there and the original hood was there. And so in every respect, we could restore the kitchen this is the upstairs kitchen. There actually are two kitchens. This was the ladies' kitchen where the lady of the house would put the finishing touches on the, uh, the food for the, for the family. Likewise, the bathrooms are um, primarily uh, have their original 
uh, fixtures uh, just as they were in 1872. And the idea that something would, would go over 100 years without getting modernized was truly uh, unique, but uh, truly made Octagon House very precious for us and for all of us, really. Uh, the top floor is one big room. It, it's uh, not quite a ballroom, more like a party room or a dance room is what it's called. The observatory has a superb view of the Hudson River, a wonderful place to watch the 4th of July celebrations and uh, on 4th of July evenings. In the well house, we found one piece of uh, the silver. Uh, and from that, we were able to fill in the entire pattern, which is Roman medallion, uh, Reed and Barton, 1868. And uh, back in the day, that was a hard thing to do by writing to collectors. Uh, today, if a piece goes missing, we can find it in a few minutes right on, on a website. But Octagon House continues to this day to um, be a, a place of discovery. And one of the discoveries was approximately 10 years ago, this set of furniture came, on, came up at an auction and it had the name Joseph Steiner in the uh, unupholstered piece. So the question was where would, a, would an Egyptian revival set of furniture have gone in the house? We knew from research that there were no domestic Egyptian revival rooms left in America. There are um, some Egyptian, number of Egyptian revival interiors, but none in a domestic sense. The left-hand bottom side is a photograph of an Egyptian revival um, library long since gone. So what we did is we restudied each of the rooms to see if perhaps there was a second layer of paint that we should have looked at. Egyptian revival became popular in 1876, approximately four years after Steiner had acquired. So it stood to reason that the second layer of paint would be the layer that we should be looking for. So we looked at each of the rooms and sure enough, on the third floor in the music room, we started to find Egyptian revival motifs. And so we were able to recreate, and I say we, the attention has to go to my son, Michael, who quarterbacked this incredible project uh, over a several year span of restoring the uh, decorative painting of the only now surviving Egyptian revival room uh, in the country. And the room has some truly remarkable pieces. We were able to find in the left-hand bottom corner, a, a Egyptian revival uh, piano, um, numerous other uh, uh, third quarter Egyptian revival American pieces to finish out uh, the room. The house is not without uh, some amusing features. We certainly uh, did a wonderful dollhouse once. Denny's in their wisdom decided that they should copy the Octagon House uh, in Las Vegas and create a Denny's in its shape. There's an Octagon House uh, mystery story and the nesting, which is a horror story, uh, was shot at the Octagon House. And there are cartoons that feature rather good uh, drawings of the, of the Octagon House. In Mount Washington, um, near Baltimore, Maryland, there was a octagonal shaped college, the uh, Mount Washington Female College. And the, a birdhouse was commissioned. Curiously enough, not in the shape of the Mount Washington Female College, but in the shape of the Armistein Octagon House. And that birdhouse had fallen on uh, bad times and been taken down. And we were able to acquire it from the United States uh, Fidelity and Guarantee Company and restore it. And it's back in um, its good condition and it's on the grounds of the Octagon House as the Octagon House Birdhouse. The Octagon House is wonderful in all seasons. Uh, a heavy snowfall creates a, an air of mystery and 
um, and just makes it even more remarkable. It never, there's never a time when Octagon House isn't uh, something very, very special in, in our minds. And it's something that we cherish. And I think all of us in Irvington uh, are, are proud to and are happy to drive past on, on a, winter's, a winter's day. I continued on with my career in much the same way that uh, townhouses and lofts were no longer uh, wanted at a certain point and were a preservationist dream. So too was the fall of the communist regime in Eastern Europe, which brought a wealth of uh, magnificent uh, structures uh, into being available. Uh, for restoration and conservation. This is Esterhaz, a palace on the left, which I worked on for two or three years uh, in conjunction with the World Monuments Fund. And then uh, I acquired the uh, Janusz Haza Castle, which was the last of the medieval castles in Hungary uh, from the Hungarian government, uh, conserved and restored and stabilized it, and did all of the research, and then turned it back to the Hungarian government. Likewise, with the World Monuments Fund, I uh, went to Southeast Asia and uh, um, worked with a, creating an architectural school that brought, pr brought pride of place to the Cambodians for their uh, vernacular houses in the Simreap uh, region of Cambodia. Never one to be faint-hearted. Um, on my trips back and forth between the United States and Hungary, I looked for uh, a building, that, a house that I could take on that would uh, make use of my knowledge of uh, architecture of the Middle Ages. And this house uh, was in a way very analogous to the Octagon House in that it had failed towers. What it is is that these towers were added in the, were extended in the 19th century. The house, the chateau had towers, but they didn't rise like they do now. In the 19th century, the 19th century owner added them as full circles, which was structurally an unsound idea. And so all four towers were failing. And so when I took on this house, um, it, it was an opportunity to uh, rescue the chateau, but also to conserve and restore it. And much like the Octagon House, I was able to make use of my knowledge to figure out the history of this house. The history of the owners was known, but not of the house itself. And you can date uh, the fabric of a house, of a medieval house, by the types of the shooting slits, because they vary over time. And that's how you, you date a medieval structure. And so this was also a truly wonderful uh, project in the Auvergne region of France, which is a, a volcanic area. Uh, the house itself is built out of volcanic stone and overlooks a collapsed volcanic lake. So each of the houses, like each of the rooms, like the rooms at Octagon House, was, were researched, restored, conserved, and furnished exactly as they were at the various periods. Some of them are 14th century and some of them are 19th century, but the rooms are as they appeared over time. Likewise, at the Octagon House, the uh, Chateau de Saint is open to the public and uh, operates as a, uh, as a museum. But it also, like the Octagon House is a family house that's enjoyed by our family and as we periodically um, use it for that purpose. And then in 2013, sort of complete the circle, um, I acquired one of the lodges in that little area of uh, Cold Spring, New York, where my family had a lodge in the 1940s and completed a lodge that had not been completed because of an interruption during the Second World War. I then went on to make the, the, the area a historic district, the Valhalla Highlands Historic District, and have been busy acquiring the lodges and restoring them back to the way they were. 
but nothing stops at the Octagon House. And so we continue on there as well. Um, Irvington was the home to the Lord and Vernon um, Greenhouse a manufactory and office building, which is now the library at the base of Main Street. Um, eventually the, the construction facilities were on the west side of the tracks, but originally they were on the east side like this photograph in the left hand top corner uh, shows. We knew that there was a greenhouse type structure or a greenhouse shaped structure uh, on the Steiner property. We could see this thin rectangle I, uh, structure C in the right hand upper corner. And excavating there, we found glass and, and shards of pieces of, of a greenhouse. And there was a record of a greenhouse on the estate, uh, the adjoining estate on the Hamilton property that was the same size as the C shape of the survey that existed on the Steiner property. And so based upon that, we searched for decades for a greenhouse, a, more specifically, a, uh, a greenhouse that would have been manufactured by Lord and Burnham in Irvington. And eventually, uh, some 10, 12 years ago, we found one, it had all of its original cast iron gears, uh, greenhouses are, are like prefabricated pieces so that even though it was the wrong size, it could be disassembled and then reassembled in the exact shape to fit on the foundation of the uh, octagon house. And here again, I have to credit 100% to my son, Michael, who quarterbacked this, uh, this incredible project. And uh, the greenhouse uh, provides the uh, the plans for the foxglove garden uh, seasonally, which are, are grown from seed. And then in 2018, the most remarkable thing for our family occurred. And that is, is that Irvington in its wisdom decided that historic buildings could be used both as a residential use and as limited uses to be available to the public. This was a dream come true because the idea that the Octagon House could be shared and appreciated by the public in a relatively passive way by, by appointment only, uh, but nonetheless that they could come and see it was just the, the best of things for our family. And I think the best of things for Irvington so that it could be shared by all. And these wonderful graphics are the graphics that my daughter-in-law Jess has done uh, for the Octagon House tours. Uh, they have become something that's widely appreciated and uh, the beautiful work that she's done. When uh, the groups go through uh, to a person, they, uh, they speak so glowingly and highly of the project of the house. Um, you can go online at any time and read these wonderful sayings that people are compelled to say uh, about their experience of having been able to see the Octagon House. The Octagon House is very much a family activity. It's, uh, it's all of us pitching together. That's grandson Enzo sweeping the porch before the visitors arrive. Um, that's a, the Octagon, the Armistein Octagon House book in the, uh, in the background, um, which is available. And this uh, Christmas, we're going to be having an Octagon House Christmas ornament, which is a careful scale uh, model of the Octagon House. And it's also an ornament. But likewise, the Octagon House, just as the Irvington law said, is a, is a home for the family. And it's a place that's appreciated by all of us uh, for celebrations and, and uh, as a place for us to enjoy. So I hope that our family has done the best that we could by the, the Octagon House. I'd like to close with this, this saying that technique is long, life is short, opportunity fleeting, experiment perilous, 
and judgment difficult. And I think that relates very much to Octagon House. And I wanna thank Irvington for allowing us to um, uh, making the restoration and continuing restoration possible by allowing it to be open to the public. And very much so the Irvington Historical Society for allowing us, our family to make this presentation. So thank you. Thank you kindly for, for all of this. Joe, um, that's marvelous. Marvelous, marvelous, marvelous. And so let, let me pose a question for you. Um, I want you to think back to when you started this project back in the 70s and you, you know, as you took this house, what was your vision at the time of how you would use the house 30 years in the future? You know, what, what did you think would be, had, would you get to live in it? What were you going to do? Just the way it is now. In other words, that was the dream that, that I could live in it, that my family could live in it, my descendants could live in it, but that it also could be appreciated by the public. And that was a dream came through. Thank you, Irvington. So a, another question that came up is, is, obviously you've done a tremendous amount of research. Had, was this just something that you learned as, a, as an architect? How did you learn to do and collect all of this information. I, I'm interested in historical research myself, and I'm just amazed at the depth of what you're able to have found, both in images and stories and history. How did you do it? So a preservation architect is research, research, and research. Okay. So in other words, that's that's the whole secret behind conservation and restoration is to know the thing and to dig in and figure it out every which way you can. It's history, above ground archeology, span paint analysis, whatever you can learn about something. And that's what we did and we followed at the Octagon House. Nothing new was added. We held out until we could find the exact right thing that was historically appropriate. And that's the guideline. And no, it, it wasn't something I learned in uh, architecture school because architecture school in the 1960s was about being an architect and it was more about modernism. So I, I built up my um, agenda with history courses at the school that I was at. But then when Columbia University got involved in historic preservation, then I was able to hone my skills at Columbia. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the question is just, um... When you were, you mentioned when you were, when you got to the house, that the hoop that held the dome had what well, hadn't been built in the house. You had to kind of recreate that. Obviously, a tremendous structural, risky thing to do to save the dome. Were there other structural parts of the house that needed to be refurbished or redone? I, I walked by it, and it's just an amazing structure. I often wonder how does it hold itself up. So, you know, what, how is it that you, this, the structure of the house has survived for so long? So the answer is this, it seems like the designer that created the shape for Steiner of the Arma Steiner Octagon House as we know it today, was a designer and not somebody who was a, either a trained architect or a structural engineer by any stretch. And that's why they, they failed to put the, the uh, tension ring at the base of the dome. But elsewhere in the house, there were other structural uh, shortcomings that we had to correct. Over and again, there were um, about the house that was structurally incorrect. And so they had to be discovered and then corrected. They're all corrected now. I can assure you that the house is structurally 100% sound. Uh, but there was indeed that, that shortcoming. So one final question, if I could turn to Michael and Jess, and maybe you could turn your audio on for the moment. I'm just kind of curious from your perspective, having those pictures of you as, at least Michael as a young kid in there, is, what's your view of how this house has affected your families and your, and your, you know, your livelihood and all the rest? Wow, wow, that's quite a question, Jet. Um, 
it has affected every aspect of my life. Uh, um, on a fundamental level, uh, it's taught me so many things uh, about setting my opinions aside, setting my uh, conjecture aside, and and really kind of staying true to what was and what is. Um, and uh, it's you know you know I, I grew up. Uh, surrounded by preservation and restoration and the work going on at the Octagon House. Um, it was uh, it was something that I, I couldn't wait to get more involved. I saw so many people just working endless hours, my father uh, devoting so much of his life to restoring it. I just, you know, I just wanted to be a part of that. And uh, uh, I got married there, my wife here and uh, and we, you know, we live here on the property and, um, you know, and it's come full circle in that I think the passion that my father has put into the restoration of the house uh, and uh, the dedication that I've put into it over the years, uh, you know, we've kind of worked just with that singular track of focus um, and uh, to be able to open up to the public and to receive feedback. Uh, it's just tremendously gratifying, you know, the response that people um, receive from, from coming from a tour. Uh, we, you know, we, I just, uh, I'm very grateful that uh, people do share their feedback because that's just the unexpected joy of the work that we've done. Um, so. Well, great. Great, great, great. So I think we've been probably going for a bit. So Veronica, maybe I could ask you to come in and, and maybe give everyone a special thanks and just some final words, if you could come back on for a second. Thanks so much. This is Veronica Gedrich, who is the president of the Irvington Historical Society and the mover and shaker behind all the things we do. Thank you, Joe, for a, a, a remarkable program and Thank you for sharing your wonderful career with us all. Um, Joe, Michael, and Jess, we all want to say we are truly grateful for what you do to preserve one of Irvington's most important structures. 